I get caught in certain lanes because people want to talk about what I talk about and I get a lot of calls from people who are tormented in turmoil serious things are going on in their life and then when you try to break it down to the choices that they're making and how they have to look at the choices that they're making to clean up the mental turmoil they don't want to do that they don't really want to dwell on that they want the they want peace with God without having to discuss um, choices that they're making so I want to um, add more to this conversation the following is an excerpt from MacArthur's New Testament commentary on Hebrews 10 and it says for if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins but a certain terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries, Hebrews 10, 26 to 27. And this is possibly the clearest and most concise scriptural definition of apostasy, which is receiving knowledge of the truth, which is the gospel, and then willfully remaining in sin. An apostate has seen and heard the truth. They know it well, but they willfully reject the truth. And apostasy has two major characteristics knowledge of the truth of the gospel and willful rejection of that every apostate is an unbeliever but not every unbeliever is an apostate because many people have never had the opportunity to even hear the gospel even in part and they're sinful they do not believe in jesus because they've never heard of him or the claims that he's made but an apostate is well acquainted with the gospel. They know more than enough to be saved, very clearly know more than enough to be saved, and then they reject it. Apart from direct association with Christians, by and large, apostates come from within the church. So please don't let this become you. Eventually, sometimes even after years of pretense and self-deception, the unbeliever who acts like a believer will finally fall away. They give up, lose interest, and they go their own way. They return to sinning willfully with no more regard for the Lord's way or for his people. To know God's way, to study about it, hear about it, to identify with believers and then turn away is to become an apostate. And the process of falling away may be gradual, but at some point a conscious decision is made to leave the way of God and reject the saving grace from Jesus Christ. And the word willfully here carries the idea of a deliberate intention that is habitual. And the reference here is not about sins of weakness or ignorance, but to those that are planned out, determined, and done with forethought. The difference between sins of ignorance and sinning willfully is much like the difference between involuntary manslaughter and first degree murder. This is habitual sin. It is not only deliberate, but it is an established way of thinking and believing. It is a permanent renunciation of the gospel and a permanent forsaking of the grace of God. And a true believer may sometimes lapse into sin, stray from intimacy from God and his people, but unless the Lord disciplines him and takes him to heaven, he will return back. That is a very scary thing too. When God disciplines someone who is his, but they return back to their sin and he takes them out of their life, he allows them to die in their sin early. That's one way God can discipline someone for going back to sin. But others are under too much conviction, if they are genuine followers of Jesus, to stay away permanently. They're so miserable out in their sin. They're robbed of joy and peace and all the other blessings. We, as outsiders of these people, cannot always determine who is apostate or who is back backsliding, and we should not even try. We're not able to distinguish a disobedient carnal believer and an apostate unbeliever because that's God's business. But there's a difference between the two, and it's a very great difference. A person's con concern should first always be that he himself is a true believer. According to 2 Corinthians 13.5, 
and then that he is a faithful believer, not just genuine, but faithful. And there are many calls to self-examination in the New Testament. Every time a believer comes to the Lord's table, which is communion, he faces the reality or the unreality of his salvation. And it's clear in the Bible that if you take communion or you come to the communion table and you're not in the faith or not in um, not right with God, that you are going to bring sickness, possibly death to yourself. That is something to be taken very seriously. God has endless compassion on the individual who is bound with sin and wishes that he were rid of it. This person is remorseful but cannot find the strength to overcome his chains. But if he prays, which he will, if he's a genuine follower of Jesus, God will bring him to someone who can pray the prayer of deliverance and set him free. Or maybe God will just reach down and touch him like he did with myself. He just because of the prayers of someone else, he touched me and removed all my chains, and he will do that for people. But the person who says in his heart, I will do as I please, and God loves me too much to do anything about it, has been deceived. And there's a lot of current teaching that actually allows people to think that. This person is sinning deliberately, and God will treat this individual as a disobedient slave. This, an example of this is like someone saying, feeling identifying as a, a born-again believer I'm going out tonight with my girlfriend or my boyfriend we're going to do sinful or sexual things that we should not be doing but tomorrow I'm just gonna ask Jesus to forgive me and he will this is actually a very deadly mistake they do not know Jesus that is definitely not something that Jesus would tolerate and they're counting the blood of the covenant by which they are sanctified as an unholy thing. They will not be forgiven the way they are planning or assuming on at all, and they will be punished for their sin. Sin always has dreadful consequences, whether or not we realize what we're doing. And sadly, oftentimes, those around us will end up suffering the consequences as well. We know what God wants but we choose to not do it, and that becomes a deliberate sin. The group that is most concerning in this area is a group that gets very angry when you bring this up, and they wanna argue this subject, and they wanna keep the grace as loose as possible so that they can sin as much as possible and still go to heaven. This mindset is compared to that of a spouse who keeps cheating and arguing over what actually qualifies as cheating and making the one that's faithful and wanting faithfulness in return to be the mean and abusive one. The one choosing wrong is demanding on the right to be married, but be excused and not held accountable for violations against that marriage due to their human weakness. And I would advise not even arguing with people. They're coming from a position of pride and idolatry, often rebellion, and all you're going to get is anger because they are not in a position to yield but you have to ask yourself, this is a marriage according to God. Is this how you want to be in your marriage with him? That's the real question you need to ask. If you find yourself angered over how far out can I go in sin without being lost, you need to look at the quality of the marriage that you're in with God. And please take time with him because you need to hear from him too. This is a very offensive position to take with a holy God. There's a difference between unintentional sin and deliberate disobedience to God. There is deception in all sin because oftentimes we're not aware of the consequences that are coming or we would not do it. Strong passion living in our living leads us to readily fall into deception, especially those of us who are um, super impulsive, we think too fast. We have the power not to act sinfully, but we've been persuaded in our mind that God is somehow permitting our action, even though it goes against what the Bible says. And this is deception that is coming from our passions. A similar um, circumstance to this would be the Christian whose lustful or romantic nature persuades them that they're married to the wrong person. And now they find their soulmate and they become convinced that the Holy Spirit wants them to abandon their present spouse and marry another. And they actually have decided to commit this act 
However, Satan has persuaded them somehow this is God's will. They're listening to the enemy because no, nowhere in the Bible would it be permitted. They would say something like, after all, God wants me to be happy. And this person leads a ministry that I'm very gifted for. This must be the will of God. This type of deception leads to much of the Christian sinning. I would say pornography is another major leader in this area where they feel like I'm not actually sinning against anyone because I'm the only person involved. You very much are sinning against your spouse. It is adultery. The consequences, if not turned from, are going to be too great to bear for both of them. Unintentional sinning would largely be avoided if the Christian would pray every day, be in their Bible every day, and in a fellowship with other fervent believers on a regular basis. And that's often what people are missing. They are not wanting to be inside of a Christian community. But this is extremely important. People who are really intent on doing this right and ending up um, hitting the mark for God are going to understand that life is one of patient endurance and there are a lot of fiery trials along the way and God will chasten every son or daughter that he receives. And the cross is his method of destroying our self-will. We must be willing to abide in the season of restrictions where God places us until he releases us because to not do so is to ensure that we're likely going to fall into sin in one manner or another. Most are not willing to wait. And I've seen this so often. People rush into, well, they're groomed quickly into a ministry position based on their giftings and their talents, but their character is not even close to where it needs to be for them to sustain that calling. And they may hold up a position by their charismatic nature but their character is so poor that the, the whole ministry will end up suffering the consequence of that person's actual, their hidden choices oftentimes. But a lot of people will avoid the entire ministry based on that one person's um, lack of obedience. There can be a difference between the forgiveness of sin and the consequences of sin. A Christian might smoke cigarettes or vape for years without realizing that this is a sin against his body and against the temple of God. They may hear a sermon at that point that warns them that smoking is a sin and it is idolatry. If they repent and stop smoking, God is going to forgive them. He will help them recover from this addiction just like any other addiction. That food, television, sex, whatever, God will forgive when we repent and turn from that behavior. But this person may yet die from lung cancer because their lungs have been destroyed by smoking. So we have to understand there's a difference between God forgiving the sin and the consequences of that sin playing out. God is always ready to forgive us when we come to him in sincere repentance, but we may and likely will reap what we have sown regardless in some of these areas. God is not going to rebuke you for what you're ignorant of or that which you have no control over, but he will rebuke you if you fail to do that which you have control over. He does not condemn us because of our unintentional sins as long as we confess and abandon them when they're brought to our attention. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness, and this is how we keep our temple spotless. But if we're casually leading a Christian life, not fervently confessing and renouncing our sin, when it's brought to our attention, not denying ourselves, not taking up our cross, and not walking with Jesus, then we're under condemnation. We have chosen to ignore our great salvation, and we shall not escape the severe punishment at the hands of God. Hebrews 10, 26 to 29 says, If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice is left for that sin, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Verse 28, Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two to three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? Author and preacher John Piper says, In other words, it's not a single act. 
It's not a few acts. It's not periodic acts. It's rather a settled, persistent continuation in sin. What destroys the soul, what puts it beyond forgiveness in verse 26 is not sin per se, but an eager, deliberate, willing, persistent, settled pattern of sin. It is a love of sin. And if we don't hold fast to the end, then we never did come to share in Christ. We can see how serious this is by looking at what comes just before and what comes just after verse 26. Verse 26 begins with the word for, which shows what kind of sin is being referred to in the preceding verses, namely the sin of forsaking the Christian fellowship and rejecting all brotherly exhortation. In other words, this person is walking away from Christ and the church. This is why church is so important. I know people... There's a lot of reasons why people don't go to church and some of it's health. But if you do not have a body of believers around you, it is going to be very hard for you to move into everything that you could. It's going to be very hard for you to sort through your own life and to sift out what is offending God when there aren't people who are even knowing you well enough to be a lens or a scope to help you. It is critical that you keep people around you that will help you to walk in obedience. Otherwise, you won't even know. I hear people who say, I, I'm assessing myself, examining myself. You, you're fooling yourself if you think you can do that. If you look at verse 26, especially at, after verse 26, especially at verse 29, you see that the pattern of sin is so deep and repeated that it's called trampling underfoot the Son of God and profaning the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and outraging the Spirit of grace. And right here is where it looks like one can lose salvation because of the reference by which he was sanctified. By such a deliberate, continued, settled pattern of sin, you can profane the blood of the covenant by which you were sanctified. Piper's conclusion is, my conclusion is that the experience of sanctification referred to in the lost person of Hebrews 10.26 and 10.29 is a measure of God-influenced moral renovation in a person that has been absorbed by being part of the church, professing some kind of faith, being attracted by many things about the Christian faith and Christian people, but never really coming to believe in Christ in such a way as to be united in him, to have a share in him and his eternal life and salvation. There's an article titled Unbelieving Born Agains written by Jean Edward Veith in which he quotes statistics um, that are drawn from a George Barna poll of born again Christians in America a number of years ago and these have gotten much worse since. It says 9% of people recently polled have a biblical worldview. However, only 7% of all Protestants maintained a biblical worldview according to his poll, and it gets worse. Of adults who attend traditional Protestant churches, Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, etc., only 2% have a biblical worldview. Among Catholics, of which there are close to 70 million conservative number in the United States, only one half of 1% have a biblical worldview. What is a biblical worldview? It is a worldview based on God's unchanging word. Since God is the creator of everything in heaven and earth, he is the standard for truth. God is all powerful, all knowing and unchanging and the Bible contains the words of God and God is truth. Therefore, we can trust what it says. On John 17, 17, 2 Timothy 3, 16 state that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Inspiration means that God breathed it out. The Holy Spirit guided and directed human beings to write down and preserve his words through the Bible. Other examples of wor worldviews are a secular worldview, which teaches that beliefs are a matter of personal preference, not absolute truth. Truth in a secular worldview comes from reason and science. Another strong one is a scientific worldview, which holds that there is nothing about na but natural elements, principles, and relations of the kind studied by natural sciences. Another postmodern worldview believes that there is no absolute truth. Personal truth is determined by your upbringing and culture, and it believes that truth is just said used to suppress and 
oppress the less powerful. The denominations that produce the highest biblical worldview are non-denominational Protestants. And even that is only 13%. And that is the group that threw the bar to where it finally settled at 9%. The Pentecostals came in at 10% and the Baptists came in at 8%. And if you do not have a biblical worldview, you are not looking at life through God's eyes. It's that simple. There's only one possible answer, and that is it, that the world around us is the lens that we are looking through. That's opposed to God. Barna said that one of the most shocking findings of this poll was the vast difference regarding morality that exists between those who show a strong biblical worldview and those who do not. What one believes as an absolute results in different behavior, and there's a clear moral effect of choosing to believe what the Bible teaches is true. John Rittenbaugh broke down the truth of this shocking survey this way. That narrow percentage, the 13%, the 7%, the 9%, the 2%, and even the one half of 1% who really sincerely believe that they have a strong biblical worldview are over 80 times less likely to endorse abortion, 78 times less likely to accept pornography as morally acceptable, 31 times less likely to live together before marriage, 18 times less likely to endorse drunkenness, 15 times less likely to condone same-sex coupling, 12 times less likely to accept profanity, 11 times less likely to accept adultery as morally acceptable, which is really shocking that that even, any of this, eight times less likely to buy a lottery ticket and 17 times less likely to actually place a gambling bet. We have to find where God places the blame here. In Hosea 4, 6 through 7, he says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I will also reject you that you shall have you shall be no priest to me, seeing you have forgotten the law of God. I will also forget your children. As they, were, as they were increased, so they sinned against me. And I warn people often that their children are going to reap great consequences from their sin, especially their sexual sin. What you do passes spiritually through your children, and they're going to struggle with the things that you brought into their lives I beg you to repent. This world is so hard. And to have your children tethered to the enemy because of your refusal to be obedient and then repent of it, many of them, we see it, are in programs, destroyed, lives are destroyed, chronic addiction. They're still trying to heal from things that they had no control over as a child. So much of it goes way back to when they were little children and had no choices. And now as adults, they're just completely running from reality because their early years were so hard. This world is hard enough. Please be obedient for your children or repent. If you haven't been obedient, please repent and break these curses from your children. The richer we become, the worse we get in terms of faith, in terms of belief, and in terms of works. In Hosea 7, 8, it says, As they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore, I will change their glory into shame. They eat up the sin of my people, and they set their heart on their iniquity. And there is the problem. This is why they do not have a biblical worldview, and this is why they do not adhere to parts of the Bible their heart is set on lawlessness. The ease of this nation has certainly played a big part in how it has abandoned God. And if we look at just nobody needs anything, everything is just handed out to every, everything. It's been the biggest, one of the biggest problems in trying to um, just care for others, even in this experience of ministry, but also in my past ones is entitlement. People are so entitled. They feel that they're owed all of these different things. And you wish you could just go drop them in India in a poor town and just show them we're not owed anything. But what is about to happen, I fully believe that is that God is going to step in and he's going to bring an end to the ease in this country. He is going to shake this nation. My 
first mentor when I moved up here to Minneapolis. She was an overseas missionary until her husband passed away. She came back and was in um, working where I came to serve, and I have stayed um, in we have, for 21 years. We have been. Um, she has been a tremendous guide. She's 95 years old, and she's in hospice for pancreatic cancer. And she still feels that Jesus is going to come in her lifetime. That's why people need to get serious, because I've met a few people that have their pulse to the Lord, and they're all very convinced we're in the final, final days. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves how Jesus is in you, except you be reprobates, meaning if you're not going to examine yourself, there's no way for you to. It, it is often asked of in the New Testament. Notice especially that the verse charges us to examine ourselves and to put ourselves to a test as to whether we are in the faith, not whether we are living by faith. It is very easy to create one's own body of beliefs and then answer in a positive yes to Paul's challenge and still be misled. Many people feel that they are living by faith, but the faith that they are living by is something they have crafted to meet the desires of their own heart, which is often greed or power. This faith in question here is a faith with a definite article, the, in front of it, indicating a specific body of distinctly related interconnected teachings. We are not to examine ourselves as to whether we believe Christ is our Savior, but as to whether we believe in and practice the body of doctrines that make up the way of Jesus Christ, and it is useless to have standards that we do not apply. It is fatally easy to make accepting of the faith a substitution for living it, eternally, fatally easy. In Luke 6, 46, Jesus said to the people who were listening to him, and why you call me Lord, Lord, and, do, and don't do the things I say. Each person must do his own self-examination. And the best ministry, can all they can do is point out where conduct is flawed. But conviction is not reached until an individual has determined to see their own sin and have brought themselves that sin under condemnation. It's very easy to live in a fantasy of self-approval, taking shelter behind a sense of good merit. James 2, 14 to 20 says, What good is it, brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. 18, But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? We are not being asked to examine ourselves as to whether we agree with the teachings of the Bible, but whether we believe them to the extent that they produce the works of which God approves. And there's a big difference between the two. This paragraph in James 2 clearly states that saying what, that one believes without conduct that matches with that claim to believe is dead faith. It is a faith that produces death, not life, and that sort of faith is no higher than a personal opinion. It has absolutely nothing eternal about it. A holy life must be lived. James is not saying that works save us. But when he, what he writes is combined with what the apostles wrote. He is saying that works will provide the evidence that we are indeed justified by the blood of Jesus Christ and that the life of God is in us and we are undeniably growing and overcoming sin. And that is what works do. They give evidence that we, that we really do believe. They give evidence that we are really born again according to the standard given in the Bible. And they give evidence that we really do have the Holy Spirit at work in us. Works do not save us, but they confirm what cannot be seen in the heart. 
And so it's an external evidence that we really do believe. 1 Corinthians 3, 13, 2 says, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. Paul is saying here the same as James 2, 14. He says, Love is the work motivated by a living faith, and without the work of love, his faith was useless and it was dead. If large percentages of born-again Christians do not have faith in what God says, what will be the works that come from the faith that they do possess? Because we know that what you believe produces works. We are looking at quite a moral crash in our nation. That is what you will see when people are following something that is unbiblical. That is why it is critical that we believe the right things. It takes belief in the right thing to produce the right works. And the more false things that are mixed with the true things, the intensity and the purity of the works are going to become such a mess. And we see that in the gospels that are being shared in most of our churches. There is clear idolatry and unbelief, no conviction. People are sitting in these churches, living together, sexually immoral. Many are in the idolatry of addictions. There's no conviction. They're sitting there completely unmoved. This shocking poll reveals that those claiming to be born again have largely embraced the same teachings and tolerance as the liberal left, the academians, the media, the environmentalists, the socially bold, and other very prominent opinion groups. What we need to do is examine ourselves as to whether we might be carelessly following the same principle of rejection of some parts of the Bible as these deceived reporting as born again. And this is a black hole you do not want to fall into. The results of this poll are staggering for morality reasons. Here's a short review. 26% of born agains believe that all religions are essentially the same. Quoting this Veith article, he says, this shows that this 26% believe that they can get to heaven regardless of what they believe, that the doctrines of the Christian religion do not matter, and this first statistic is beginning to show how many are claiming a right to heaven and creating their own personal faith, essentially their own personal religion. Yet they are claiming to be born again, according to the Bible. The next statistic revealed that 50% of those confident that they are saved believe that a life of good works enables a person to go to heaven. And this belief alone takes the Savior right out of the salvation equation. The cross never needed to happen. Jesus never needed to come and die if there was something people could do to earn their way to heaven. And the Bible is very clear that we are saved by grace through faith alone. And this is faith that comes from what Christ did on the cross. We are not saved by works. The group who feels that there is some way to get there around the blood of Jesus Christ faces a terrible shock when they die and meet God face to face. The wrath of God is what they are going to meet and they will not be going to heaven. The third statistic that has 35% of born again Christians do not believe that Jesus rose from the dead. This is incredible because this throws the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 15 right out of the Bible because it says at the beginning of the chapter that 500 people saw Jesus at one time. At one assembly, there were 500 people, 500 that could give witness to seeing him after his death and resurrection. In addition to this, Romans 10, 6 through 10 tells us clearly that if we do not believe that Jesus rose from the dead, we are not Christians. This disbelief wipes out any hope of you being saved at all. And it is the practical ramifications of what we choose to believe that are so important because we will act on what we believe. And if we do not believe what God teaches, we will not act like a child of God. The sin of unbelief is probably one of the most offensive to God. And when he clearly states, and the whole Bible is written around the death and resurrection of Jesus, 
I can't think of how you would even read the Bible and not believe that. In the born agains of this survey's pride, they are lifting themselves to the same level as God, as having the authority to determine what is good and what is evil. And these born again people seem to represent the very cream of the followers of Christ, and they reject much of what he says. And this particular issue of contention is the very hope of the Christian life. When we think of this in a national sense, it is a wonder that we're in the state that we're in. But there's more. 45% of people claiming to be born-again Christians do not believe Satan exists. 10% believe in reincarnation. And I'm sure that these people don't understand that in the position they're taking, they are calling Jesus Christ a liar. They do not even think about the fact that they're calling Jesus a liar. Either he's lying or they are. They claim he's their savior, but then they call him a liar. Because Jesus himself said, I saw Satan fall from heaven as lightning but they don't agree with that. He saw it, he said it, they did not see it, and they do not believe that he's telling the truth, that Satan does not just represent evil, he is evil, and he is alive, and he's roaming the earth as a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. They have been devoured. These incredible statistics give a clear understanding that people calling themselves Christians feel free and clear to believe anything that they choose. The devil does not need you to believe in him. He would prefer you didn't. He just wants you to be like him and not follow Jesus. Do what your own mind or feelings tell you to do. That's his religion. Instead of yielding to their supposed savior or what he tells them to believe, they find justification to do as they please in some area of their life, almost always giving them permission to sin in an area that they want to sin. And it's no wonder that Jesus in his last recorded prayer in John 17, five times asked God, please make us one in the same way that you and I are one. He says, even as, meaning in like manner, equal to the way the Father and the Son are one. And this is a major problem, getting all people to believe the same thing, almost impossible. 33% of born agains believe that it's acceptable in God's sight for couples to live together in fornication before marriage. That's a very telling statistic, that 27% of born-again Christians are likely to have experienced the divorce more than even non-Christians. There's something very wrong here. What's very troubling is when, and we see this a lot, sadly, that women are becoming pregnant and they're not married and people in ministries are congratulating them and applauding them and they're celebrating this child which the child is not the sin but if someone really knows jesus and they love you really they are not going to applaud you for committing adultery on jesus because if you're not married, you're his until you are. You have really positioned yourself against that relationship. And it is advisable that people would not further affirm that as something to be celebrated because there's blood on your hands for doing that. I do agree to serve and take care of pregnant women who are not married. I completely agree to care for them, but we never want to put a seal of approval from God on that because until there is some kind of repentance or accountability for that sin, they've put that child in a bad position spiritually. They've put themselves in a bad position spiritually. And anyone who does not gently tell them they need to repent is also in a bad position. 
Rather, not everyone is in a position to gently tell them that, but certainly don't come up in applause behind them. There's something very wrong when the whole Christian community is applauding sexual immorality openly. When leaders of the faith, when ministers are congratulating people on their sexual immorality producing fruit. These statistics reveal that large percentages of the supposedly deeply converted people are not conforming themselves to biblical truths. That is not just the people that are in sin, it is those who are affirming their sin. And it's getting to be more and more common. Even 20 years ago when I came here, I did not see that. I never saw that happening. And I've, even before that in ministry, was certainly able and willing to help young women who were pregnant, but I never saw people celebrating it like I do now in the church. Another aspect that's being revealed by this poll is that these people, while they're undoubtedly religious, are still conformed in belief and practice to the dominant secular culture and are living according to the dictates of whatever faith exists in their head. They're not coming out of the world. They remain of the world. And if Jesus Christ came to this planet as a model of how we ought to live, then our goal needs to be to act like Jesus. And sadly, few people consistently demonstrate the love, obedience, and priorities of Jesus. The primary reason that people do not act like Jesus is because they do not think like Jesus. Behavior stems from what we think, our attitudes, beliefs, values, and opinions. And although most people own a Bible and know some of its content, Research shows that most Americans have little idea how to really integrate biblical principles that are core principles to form any kind of meaningful response to the challenges and opportunities of life. And we're often more concerned with a survival mindset in all this chaos than with experiencing truth and significance. The church needs to do better. Discipleship is critically needed. It's hard for me when people ask me, where should I go to church? I want to learn the Bible. I want to be discipled. I want a Bible study where I'm going to learn the Bible. And I can't think of any. In almost every area, it's very hard. It's very hard when you can't think of hardly any where you can say, I know that they do Bible studies there where you can really learn the Bible. This is the metro area. This is Minneapolis, St. Paul. And it's very hard to find that. People are church their entire lives and they know hardly very, very little about the Bible. Second Peter 3, 3 through 5 says, Know this first, that there will come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of all creation. For this they willingly, willingly are ignorant of the word of God. The heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. There is a deliberateness in the rejection of parts of the Bible that they find is going to cost them personally or they just don't want to submit to it. Religion to many is truly a personal and emotionally determined experience and that's all it is. God's worth is true, God's word is true, and our duty and our obligation is to submit to it. There's going to be three things that there are going to be three things we don't agree with or we don't even feel capable of accepting at times, but we don't have the option if we are genuinely with Christ to be stopped in by our nature and to sit and evaluate whether or not we have one option, overcome it, accept it, and make it part of our lives. As a follower of Jesus, in this covenant relationship, that is the only option. This lack of knowledge that Paul talked about 
does not stem from a shortage of information, but from a deliberate rejection of much of the overwhelming amount of biblical evidence available. And there's a neglectful willfulness caused by distractions from many sources. People have been persuaded that God's word is nothing but writings of men and not absolute. The practical effect is that they're constantly straddling the fence and creating their own religion. This will be shown in the end as a choice. It's a choice that each person is making. They could choose to believe the Bible and do it, or they can choose to create their own. And in their own mind, they know. They know they're creating their own. This survey reveals that many are passing themselves off as deeply committed worshipers of Jesus Christ, but they have very shallow conviction, and their efforts to submit to God are weak at best. Their understanding of the deadly seriousness of God's word to life and the times that we live in is very shallow. The core that sustains any relationship, allowing it to grow and produce the most and the best is trust. And these people clearly do not trust God and the evidence is in the rejection of his word. So what kind of a relationship can you have with a God if you do not trust him? And Hebrew 11, Hebrews 11, it says, the just shall live by faith. In Ephesians 2, it says we are saved by grace through faith. The statement in Hebrews 11 is at one and the same time both a command and a declaration that those called the just will submit to the word of God. Our entrance to the kingdom of God into his family is going to be based on whether we trust God. And if we trust God, then he will trust us. And there's nothing hard about this equation. There's an exchange made here. We are being called upon to trust him without ever seeing him. And so the just, those who are upright, will live by trust, trusting in him. And we live in a culture that is so confused and lukewarm to God's word and to Christianity. God himself said he is going to vomit this culture out. And that's why he warns us to come out of it. So we're not going to be destroyed when he does that. He's been very clear what he will do with it. We cannot allow this world to distract us into this false gospel because it leads to one place, hell. Never settle for any of these uncertain, unsure, anyone who talks of this nature, you flee false teachers. If they love Jesus and you more than themselves or whatever it is they're getting out of being a religious teacher, they would shout the truth rather than calmly letting you sit there in your sin. They would be screaming to you that this is going to end up in hell. If they loved you, they would stop you from exploiting your sin. They certainly would not applaud you in it. Our eternal life is on the line and God demands of us that we know, believe, and do his word, regardless of what others choose to do. We've been given the power to do all three. We have no excuse and we're responsible to sacrifice our life to it. God has endless compassion on an individual who is bound with sin and wishes he were rid of it. He's remorseful but cannot find the strength to overcome his chains. But God will help him. If he comes to God in prayer, God himself will help him. That's what we were as a ministry. Seven Bells was birthed to be about prayer and speaking the truth of the gospel. The enemy has given us many opportunities to mission drift but fortunately, we have a great board and ministers who keep pulling us back on our mission. This is a treacherous field, telling the truth and helping people get free in Christ. It's treacherous out here. We're living in a time that must be very close to what was recorded in Judges, where it says, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. The book of Judges does not show Israel at that time as being irreligious. They were just the opposite. They were very religious. They just had the wrong body of beliefs. And it's just like that today. By way of comparison, polls show that 80% of American people say that religion is important to them. 60% say that it is very important to them. It's just that their beliefs are completely wrong. They don't match the Bible. And yet these people consider us intolerant of their lifestyle. We become the enemy, and even at this time, they're moving against us. The censorship that's going on on Facebook alone is pretty stunning lately. Ray Bradbury says, but you can't make people listen. They have to come around in their own time wondering what happened and why the world blew up around them. 
James 4, 17 says, So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Hebrews 4, or 6, 4 through 6 said, For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Hebrews 10, 26 to 31 for if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Matthew seven twenty one to 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Second Peter 2 Peter 2.4 For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment. Ephesians 4.30 And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Romans 1 22, claiming to be wise, they became fools. 1 John 3, 1 through 24 says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world did not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when we appear, we shall be like Him. When He appears, we shall be like Him because we shall see him as he is, and everyone who hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Second Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.8, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are many verses to support the position I want to end on this promise. Malachi 3, 1 through 3. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, says the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And we are approaching it. And who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, like fuller's soap, and he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering of righteousness. The Levites are a type of church, and God specifically mentions that before Christ returns, he's going to sift as a refiner's fire, and he is going to purge the spiritual Levites, and that is us. That is how we know that persecution is going to arise. God is going to accomplish two things at the same time. He's going to punish the people of Israel, but at the same time he does that, he's going to awaken us to our responsibilities to him. He's going to purify us so that we'll be prepared by the very things that we have to go through in order to be like him, and that is coming. It's coming fast. Our responsibility is to not be like the religious Israelites who are rejecting the word of God. We have to accept, believe, and do what the word of God says in order to show, to give evidence of our faith, of our trust, and of our loyalty to God in order that we might grow and be like the Son of God. So during this period of time, the false and cowardly believers are going to be removed. This is a time of preparation and the purpose of this training is to produce an instinctive right response to the ways of God. It needs to become our first nature. And if we will take advantage of that time, we will have the opportunity to stand firm in the days of training, meaning right now during this time, in the smaller things, they're about to become immediate and dangerous conditions, and we will stand firm because the verse asks, who will stand firm? let it be us. If you need to reconnect with God after sinning, for those who are in sin and know you can't 
follow Jesus and keep willful sin. You're choosing to reject him. You must acknowledge that you are sinning and you must admit your sin to him. You cannot hide your sin because we've seen in the Bible the consequences of trying to hide our sin. Pride drives us to hide our sin. Pride is the way of Satan. David was a man after God's own heart. He chose not to hide his sin. Don't you hide yours either. Be honest about your sin. Be open with God. There's nothing to be gained by hanging on to it for five more minutes because there will be five more minutes, five more minutes, five more minutes, and pretty soon there will be no more time. So I would throw it down. I would abandon myself to Jesus Christ completely and fully. I would never let one sin keep me from everything that God has coming because the hard days are coming right up and the sorting is going on right now. Precious Lord, help us to be faithful. Protect us from all of the temptations that are coming our way. Help us, God, to be the people who default to obedience quickly that we don't entertain and fantasize about the things the enemy brings our way. Help us, Jesus, to be standing when you need us most. Help us to be that bright light on a hill when people know it can be done. You can be faithful. You can honor Jesus in this dark time. I ask you for just miraculous intervention into every person who hears me, that you would grab their hearts for yourself, God. Give them no rest until they abandon all sin and come humbly to the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. Be glorified, Lord Jesus, in my life and those around me. In Jesus' name, amen.